Hi, I'm Dr. Len Baer, and it's finally September. This is a week 36 episode of our, our extraordinary podcast about an extraordinary lawsuit featuring some extraordinary people. And of course, I'm talking about Anna Toledo, whose name has become a symbol of our liberation. The other day, someone called her Joan of Arc, but I respectfully disagree. John was born on a stake. And unless we're sending you to Hawaii, Anna, you are safe. <laughs> good morning, Anna. How are you? Good morning, Len. I'm I'm really good. I am um I'm looking forward to this break. I've been working real hard on the brief, as you know, that is due on Tuesday. And um it's it, it's an immense responsibility, but I am taking it, you know what it as what it is which is you know the opportunity for all of us to be free i know this is uh you describe this as a spa day for you and i have just the person to cheer you up our special <laughs> guest and my dear friend all the way from the kangaroo land ever charming craig laforest welcome to the podcast craig Thanks. Thanks very much, Len. It's wonderful to, to be here. I, I would love to help the spa day for Anna. Uh, <laughs> we just need to make sure that our destinations are exactly the same at some point, but lovely to be here from Sydney. Craig, if you know, if you don't know, is a board member of ICATOR, and we just had the president of this international organization, Melanie Rishan, on our last podcast and i had a chance to attend a fundraiser meeting last night for icator i highly recommend supporting supporting icator in their mission to fight for the rights of targeted individuals in belgium using their unique rules of jurisprudence icator ran into some hiccups and need your help and we had targeted justice support their efforts craig we'll get back to you later but first a legal segment with anna toledo um, well, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit. I've been working real hard on the um, on the brief, and um, it, you know, when when you look back at at this at these six months and what we have gone through, it, it, it's it's to, to to me, it's just so clear. You know, I and all of us, you know, we see it so clear that it is time to remove from the terrorist screening database people that don't belong there uh and and i am um very hopeful that uh justice will prevail and that we will um that because the truth and the constitution are on our side and also god but i just wanted to share with you a little bit um I, i'm not going to go into detail but you know as targeted individuals we all know the things that we have to physically go through uh and sometimes intellectually in this battle for your brain. So um, it is no um, easy feat to do no, on normal circumstances. It is very challenging for an attorney to carry out this kind of work because like you have the pool of attorneys that are admitted to all the states. Then there's a smaller pool that are admitted to federal courts. Then there's a smaller pool that litigate in courts of appeal. And so, uh, you know, at, at every level gets harder. So uh, carrying out filing and, and preparing and doing this kind of appeal work is very intellectually challenging. So to all those targets out there, imagine when you have, uh, you know, government criminals uh, attacking your intellectual, you know, production. But God is on my side and, and it has been a very interesting and a a, a good learning process. So I'm I'm really happy and I'm not done yet, but I will be done on time. Well, I'm very sure of that. Today, we have a chance to spend some time looking in depth at one aspect of our case that, in my opinion, has been sufficiently illuminated. I'm talking about the motion for, prelim for preliminary injunction. I prepared some, some slides and allow me to share my screen with you. I called my slides, how Houston judge mishandled preliminary injunction. And it's based on our conversation, Anna, and it's based on my reading of the legal filings. 
So let's get to it. So you filed preliminary injunction on February 5th of 2023. And I remember that time. I remember right after we filed uh, the lawsuit, the intensity of our torture has increased so dramatically. And all 18 plaintiffs really complained about how their torture increased the level, the duration, the intensity. It, it was really unbearable. And so what you did, you filed a motion for preliminary injunction. And you argued that a na nationwide injunction is needed to fully prevent the irreparable injury to plaintiffs, targeted justice members, and those equally situated. And then you also mentioned that the cases that have challenged before the legality of lists within the TSDB, uh, terrorist screening database, were limited to its portions containing the names of KST means, uh, help me. Known and suspected terrorist. Known and suspected terrorist, thank you. And have no effects on this court's injunctive power in this lawsuit. To our best information and belief, there is no pending claim in any other United States court requesting the remedy herein. Do you have anything to add to the sort of my view of this preliminary injunction, Anna? Yeah, well, you, um, yes, it was filed on the 5th and legally uh, the defendants were supposed to answer on the 28th, uh, but then they requested to answer it, not at that time, because they would have had to address the arguments we put in there, but simultaneously with the answer to the complaint. And what that did was that they didn't have to address the issues raised there. Uh, we, uh, at that time I was in France and within two days, the court granted that motion, even though plaintiffs have 21 days to oppose any other motion. And if it had been an urgent motion, well, at least a, a seven day a term should have been granted. Uh, so within two days, the court approved the extension of time that defendants requested. In that um, uh, situation, the, what we argued, which is to this day the truth, is that it is an uncontroverted fact, an admission by defendants, that there are people in handling codes three and four that do not meet the terrorist criteria and do not represent a national security threat. Therefore, pursuant to Homeland Security Presidential Directive says that was the one that gave way to the infamous TSDB, the FBI doesn't have a legal authority to put people in there that are not known or suspected terrorists. So let me show this slide. What happened uh, when the judge uh, declined the motion to for preliminary injunction, the judge refused to acknowledge the falsity of defendant's statements. And this is this particular statement that I uh, picked up on. The government said that we, the, T the target justice, were challenging a small part of the data set that had non-terrorists in it. And this is a huge, hairy lie because DOJ own documents established that 97% of the persons on the list are non-investigative subjects. Am I correct? Is this a huge, hairy lie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Este, the, they wanted to, to just say, oh, no, it's a few people. And, and that's precisely part of, of what we're arguing is that, uh, you know, the, they say that uh, the non-investigative, first of all, they also said the other night, I don't know if you're going to cover it, that, that I made up the term non-investigative subjects when that is contained in, the, in their, uh, in their uh, audit reports. But when they say that there are some people there because of an exception, and you realize that that exception constitutes 97%, well, by definition, they are not an exception. They are the majority. The exception in the terrorist screening database are the known and suspected terrorists because they, pursuant to United States Department of Justice audit reports, only comprise 0.29% of the database. So most of the I... people 
on the list shouldn't be on the list. I understand your point, Anna. But what really bothers me is not that the defendant slide, but that the judge did not acknowledge the falsity of these statements. But let me explain to you why. Because what the court did is, since they dismissed the complaint and the injunction is accessory to the complaint, the court did not go into the merits of the injunction. Even though we pointed out the incorrect statements of fact that it contained and that the mo and the incorrect statement of fact that the motion to dismiss contained. Next slide. This is apparently the first time in all cases challenging the terror screening database that the court refused attorney access to the database. In this case, the court deprived plaintiffs of their right to discover evidence under the exclusive control of defendants that self-servingly hide it from plaintiffs. Am I correct, Anna? That is correct. And precisely that's one of the issues that we're uh, doing on appeal because on April 8th, we filed a motion to compel limited discovery uh, asking to get uh, access to the information, the TSDB status on the 18 plaintiffs. And the court not only um, disregarded, ignored this motion, uh, but uh, when that is when defendants uh, filed uh, the sworn statement by Mr. Robinson talking about uh, the secret criteria of placing people there and, and all, all that story that it could not be disclosed. The, the important thing is that if the people are not known or suspected terrorists, they should not be on that list. Mm -hmm. And there is no reason for uh, invoking a law enforcement privilege when the people don't meet the terrorist criteria. And so in the pre prior cases, El Haiti, all of those, in El Haiti case, for example, Mr. Abbas had access to the TSDB. Uh, in other cases, more recent, the court has Okay, hasn't ordered the attorney to see it, but has ordered the defendants to provide the court with the TSCB, such as Kovac versus Ray, and, and the court has examined it. So what um, what is interesting in this case is that if the court had examined it and checked that plaintiff's names are there, it could not have reached the conclusion to say that they don't suffer injury in fact. And that's one of the arguments that, you know, that we are um, setting forth that it is, you know, a, sometimes you don't want to see things for a reason. So it, it is our position that the court did not intentionally did not want to know or see just so that it could say, well, we uh, the, the, the plaintiffs didn't prove that they are on the list, even though at a pleading stage, you don't have to have evidence. At a pleading stage, you just have to have very well written and substantiated pleadings. So yeah, you're totally right. It's the first case. This is the first case where a court denies the plaintiffs access to the information and or doesn't the ask to expect the information a uh, the court on itself. I also want to point out that a few episodes ago we were talking about a something uh, similar issue and i said that they denied us the privilege of looking at the database and then you corrected me that this is actually not a privilege but it is our right and therefore i highlighted it this time so very good reminder for me and so then i think that the day of reckoning is coming and you can see where it's going to happen in New Orleans. And we will all, all looking forward to that day. I am too. I am too. Uh, it, it's a huge responsibility. And, uh, and I am, um, a, you know, I work, I work a, every day at all times. I am honored to be carrying this responsibility because uh, like Gareth Ike says, you know, this is the most important lawsuit of the century. This will definitely change the course of history, and uh, um, and so I, I I feel very honored 
to to be uh, working for this. Yes, that that was a spectacular uh, quote by Gareth Hyde. So as we can see, all roads lead to New Orleans. And while only attorneys will be allowed to argue in front of the appellate court judges, I guarantee I will be sitting next to Anna on one side and Richard Lighthouse on the other. Good luck getting in that courtroom that will be filled with targeted individuals while a peaceful rally will be taking place outside of the courthouse. And it will be spectacular. And now to our special guest, Craig LaForest. Craig, what's on your mind these days? I know uh, you recently announced the podcast, and I can't wait to see you in action. You simply radiate light and optimism anywhere you go, and I hope you'll share some of your magic with us today. Craig? Thanks, Lynn. Thank you very much, and thank you, Anna. It's... It's a privilege to be part of Targeted Justice and a board member of ECATUR. We are working so hard as you are uh, around the world to, to stop these dreadful technologies being used on, on people. So I'm going to bring as much light as I can to the subject. Uh, I am typically bombarded by the outside forces, as everybody is aware. But from my, my point of view, it's just so important and it's just wonderful to be able to have this podcast for the future. We have not many people here in Australia who are affected by this, but ever since, it's interesting, ever since the podcast was announced, I've had people contact me and I've met them who are just going through the hell, the torture that so many of us go through, whether it's the V2K voices or direct energy weapons burning their bodies as they as they do on mine. So I'm I'm very happy to be here as part of, of the team. We have to fight this. I um, now that I'm retired, this is my this is my directive as uh, you know from from my higher power, my creator, and I will do the best that I can. Very well said. Correct me if, if I'm wrong, but it is my impression that some TIs actually shy away from talking about the so-called V2K because of the public's attitude toward hearing voices. However, it is important to talk about it and educate the public and the uninformed so-called experts. That's why I prepared some slides. Allow me to share them with you and get your commentary. So before I share the slides, I want to tell you that I challenge myself to put only mainstream mentions of this technology into this presentation and kept the, the technological really complicated part to the minimum. And it was done on purpose because I imagine that this conversation would be widely shared with friends, family, neighbors, and colleagues of uh, targeted individuals whose friends are often roll their eyes once, especially once presentation gets too technical. So that was my challenge, just to put mainstream mentions of this technology. And I did it in chronological order. I call this presentation sensation of hearing sounds because there's a difference between a sound as an acoustic event and a sensation that occurs in our brain. And the subtitle is what's going to try to understand the V2K phenomenon. The first time microwave auditory effect was mentioned in the scientific literature was 1961. And it uh, later it was called the Frey effect after the scientist who described it, Alan Frey, who discovered that yes, indeed, a microwave with a when it has certain pulse width and certain pulse repetition rate, let's just call it modulated microwaves, with that certain modulated microwaves can produce a sensation uh, of sounds described as buzz, click and hiss knocking and similar effects. And what was interesting is in addition to the sound, Frey was able to induce perception of severe buffeting of the head. Are you familiar with the term buffeting? I put I put I, that. Yes, I I am. I am Len. I have heard heard of it. 
Yeah, it's an actually aeronautic term that describes a, a flying object exposed to turbulence. So this kind of turbulence was applied to this phenomenon that microwave can induce sensation of buffeting. Some call it vibration, some call it thumper. There, there are different ways to describe it. Have you ever experienced something like this, uh, uh, Craig? I have. I have, Len. Uh, every time I travel, uh, if I'm in a hotel room or on a ship with the air conditioning, I feel this buffeting come through. Uh, it's it's absolutely overwhelming, the pain, the physical pain you go through. And the B2K voices uh, are right into my right into my head. It's, it's so unfortunate that I sometimes have to upgrade because of the pain. I have to upgrade into another seat on a plane simply because the pain is so overwhelming. I, I couldn't sit next to someone. The, the tears literally roll down down your cheeks as you're, you're trying to get to a destination. I've just uh, returned to Australia after three months away and I did several cruises uh, through Greenland and Iceland and up to the North Cape after going up the west coast of Africa to, to Barcelona. And I was literally bombarded by this buffeting. I had it every single day. The the creation that we have of Earth is spectacular between the sea, the ocean, and and nature in itself. But I was hit with this every single day. And it was it was overwhelming. It was nonstop. Uh, the more I talked about it with guests on board the ship, I was uh, bombarded even more. I was woken out of the deepest sleep. And even when we had no Wi-Fi on board the ship, military satellites were being being used. And how abusive that is for people to, in whatever realm they're in, whatever organization they're involved in, to be able to use military satellites when we can't even, we're paying for those through our taxes or the United States is, depending on which military satellite is being used. But it's um, it's a... It's just a technology which is so overwhelmingly um, concentrated on hurting individuals around the world, victims. And a lot of these people don't aren't aware of it. I, I'm literally sitting here at the moment and I can feel the waves of the directed pulse the coming coming through my body. Yes. I have a question. When you talk to people and mention the fray effect, does an average person heard the name? <laughs> Uh, they, are they familiar with it? Uh, because this is established science. 1961, mm. that's a long mm. time ago. Mm. Are people aware of it? People are aware of it. I'm becoming... Um, I, I speak openly about this wherever I am in the world. I, you get to a point that you try to help future generations. And I, I don't care what effects I'm going to have from the perpetrators, the operators of this crime. I, I speak broadly about this on radio and people are slowly becoming aware I've, I've lost members of my family because they just don't want to know about it, which, which I can respect because perhaps they believe they're going to be the next targeted victim. However, I have um, great friends who have done the research and I've been in touch with, as we know, uh, Robert Duncan and, and we're doing some work through ICATUR with um, Barry Trower, who was the co-developer of for MI5 with this technology. So it's a, a very slow process that we're seeing not only through the court cases that you, you're involved with, um, and we are in, in in Belgium, but this is a very slow process. And I, I respect people who don't want to know the information about these technologies, but we're seeing it every single day, young children walking around with these. We've gone from land landlines. When I was born back in 53, we had a landline. We didn't have a a message machine that would pick up a message. We've then gone to cell phones and we've now gone to these little instruments that they put in their ear with the microphone. And I know the, the pulsing is coming through that and and uh, language which we would not typically pick up is being put into their brain subliminally, very, very carefully, very cautiously. So I um, I'm, I have some great friends who've done the research. They they understand it. They've taken the time to listen to the videos. They listen to uh, our podcast here with Targeted Justice. I've given them so much information and they get it. This is actually encouraging uh, to hear that regular people heard of the Frey Effect. Anna, do you have some comments? Yes, um, I'm here from my attorney perspective. I, I want to uh, tell you, um, yeah, Craig, and ask you, uh, one of the Substack newsletters we made was 
for uh, TIs that have uh, B2K to do maybe like a 15, 30 minute um, transcript of what these you know voices say to them. And the reason mm -hmm. for this is that uh, I, I am always looking at when everybody gets their, their day in court. And uh, to people that don't experience this, including myself, it is very hard to understand the level of um, it, how debilitating this could be, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of our plaintiffs was did the, the homework for me, you know, and, and she and she wrote it for 30 minutes. And, and I just tell TIs out there, first of all, I am convinced that we're all going to get, they're all going to get their day in court. And, and I want to emphasize how important it is to journal, not to believe, because uh, I'm going to ask you about that, but not necessarily to believe what these, because for me, they're criminals. If they mm -hmm. torture you, they are criminals and they do not deserve any, any inch of credibility. But at the same rate, to, to keep your journal and your diary as because, uh, for example, one of the grandmothers that has a 10 year old who is tortured, the voices tell the, vo the, the little girl, we're going to eat your stomach. And that's the kind of thing that I can just see a judge's face go like, like, yeah. like, oh, yeah. my God, you know. And yeah. so I, I just wanted to add that comment in there. Because um, journaling, not paying attention and having conversations with them, I don't know if you do that, but but basically journaling is is a very valuable tool for TIs when their day in court arrives in terms of proving how atrociously debilitating this yeah. this horrible uh, yeah. torture <clears throat> is. We're going chronologically. So the next slide is about voice modulation. Uh, for the first time in the literature, it was reported in 1975, and it described an experiment that took place in 1973. The article was published in American Psychologist by Don Justison, and the experiment that took place in 1973 at Walter Reed was such that modulation of microwave energy resulted in direct wireless and receiverless communication. Specifically, they encoded nine words and the scientists who participated in the experiment were able to hear, identify, and distinguish among these nine words. So this is the official point in history when voice modulation, not just hiss and sounds, but the actual words were able to be transferred using microwave energy. Were you aware of this, uh, Craig? No, I was, I was not aware of it, Len. I was aware that in 1953, which was the year I was born, was the introduction of the MK Ultra program, and it was supposed to end in 1972. So this is just another component of that, I, I believe. And we know obviously that it's it's been extended. Okay, fair enough. So now from 1973, we're going forward to 2004. And I'm sure you all heard about this project Medusa, uh, which still can be found in the Navy search database. And it describes non-lethal microwave weapon developed for the U.S. government by a company later acquired by Sierra Nevada Corporation. MEDUSA stands for Mob Access Deterrent Using Silent Audio. It produced auditory effect loud enough to cause discomfort and or incapacitation. However, project was canceled because the weapon, the non-lethal weapon that was supposed to be used on crowd dispersal actually induced brain damage. What do you think, Craig? It's dreadful. It's absolutely dreadful. I am aware of, of that. And we we now uh, in Australia, God forbid, are using this, this weapon on dispersing crowds. We had about three months ago, a crowd in front of Parliament House in Canberra, which is our federal capital, and they were dispersed with one of these, one of these machines, and people just aren't aware of the damage, as as you say, Len, to the brain. What's going on here? How dare you use this on people and not know the technology 
behind it. It's, uh, it's outrageous. My favorite word with this, this whole uh, scheming of, of technology is outrageous that you take these machines and whether they're via a, a directed machine similar to the one that was that was uh, in, in Canberra or via satellite or 5G, how dare you do this to innocent people and continue to do it? We know that it we know that this these technologies work. Why aren't you stopping this? I call the perpetrators, the operators of this crime, cats. C A T S. They are cowards. They are actors, and they are traitors. And I can always see through the acting. I've had every single story related to me in the initial stages of me recognizing that I had V2K and was burning, being burned on my body. They would come in the middle of the night and say things like, you've got to get out of bed. You're an outgoing personality. We're going to make you the secretary of state. You're going to be flying around the world, having all these audiences because you love people so much. You love life so much. And it continued. And now we need to, we need to uh, check your heart rate in the middle of the night. And I caught on to this about a week after it happened back when I first arrived back into Sydney in 2011, having lived in Los Angeles from, two, uh, from 1983 to 2011. And I, uh, I was just appalled at what was going on. And, and the more I researched this, the more that I found there are so many other people who are afflicted by this. These people, these, these perpetrators, they have a, a kind of cognitive dissonance. Uh, for example, they'll call me fat. Go to the gym, you're fat. You need to go and work out. So I go exhausted and then they attack. Uh, each of them are trying to teach their sick souls to to work out what our souls are about. That's that's my belief. They don't understand that their their only rest, their respite, if you will, is to attack others. And this is cognitive dissonance. And you, when you look at the perpetrators and research, who does this type of evil to people? Uh, you can you can look at um, the history of people who've done this around the world. And it's, it's cognitive dissonance can include being forced to comply with something against their beliefs, having to decide between different choices and having to put effort into the goal. So many times they've said to me that they know the difference between right and wrong. Every, every one of them has, has said that to me. I have the standard people morning, noon and night who come back at me. So they, they work in shifts, as we know. It's it's really it's really manipulation at its extreme. That is truly upsetting. The point I wanted to make with this slide with this slide that this is a weapon, a non-lethal weapon, based on the microwave auditory effect. And even though it doesn't produce voices, the principle, the methodology uh, by which it's working is still microwave auditory effect. Next slide. Now we're in 2007, Wired Magazine, pretty mainstream. And the name of the article is The Voice of God Weapon Returns. So they reported on some uh, government operative who went to a government workshop and they told him about this device that operates at a distance and would deliver a message that only a single person could hear. It was tested in a conflict situation in Iraq and was pointed at one insurgent in a group who whipped around looking in all direction and began a heated conversation with compatriots who did not hear the message. Sounds familiar? Mm. It's, That's exactly it's it's exactly what happens. Uh, and as back to back to Anna's point earlier on, Len, the language which is used is so disgusting, so vile, so abhorrent. It's the antithesis of what normal, regular people would say. Um, it's it's stunning, and and I know Robert Duncan has referred to this that there's a script that is used. So yeah, I, I, I couldn't even repeat some of the language they use. However, I've got a, a great mate down here, just a recent friend of mine from a month ago who has, it's a parallel of what I'm going through with what he's going through. And we met uh, on the phone one day and he's he's been over to my place a couple of times and he's so wonderful to have another TI, even though we go through this hell, 
explaining what words come in. I and mean, we can be sitting there having a, a lovely conversation and he's hit and I'm hit. And it's a, it's a standard. It's a standard. And this is, it gets back to the sad obsession that people have that if they don't understand themselves, they don't understand how people are being successful or people are doing the best they can and, and giving back in the world, which is what I try to do. I work for some nonprofit organizations. I work with the Mercy Ships up in uh, uh, the west coast of Africa. And I was blessed when I did this cruise from from Cape Town recently up to Barcelona. We went up the West Coast and I was invited to go on board the Global Mercy, which is their new hospital ship. And you see these young children coming on board with their cleft lips and and their legs, the bow legs. and But all the way up, all the way up the West Coast of Africa, when you saw how blessed you were to be able to afford to be there, to meet lovely people on board the ship. And I, um, I've been on this cruise line many times. And to go into these places where you have third world, fourth, fourth world countries, it's 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 stunning to think and believe that people still still do this uh, to us around the world. So uh, I I it's a, for the people who are listening for the very first time. If you are a TI and you have a family member or a friend who might want to understand more, I think this will be a wonderful opportunity. This podcast will be great because it gives you an opportunity to also understand, having done the research on what targeted individuals are and and what we go through is also to look at the the perpetrators these these narcissists and all i can suggest is that you educate yourself about narcissistic personality disorder mpd it, it's a mental health condition in which people have an unreasonably high sense of their own importance build your own for the for the ti build, continue to build your own self esteem Speak up for yourself, but not to the narcissist, not to the the perpetrators. Do not respond to them because they will lie. They will set you up. That's part of the process, part of the program that they enjoy. And practice skills to keep calm. And I, I listen to music. I have concerts in my home. I, I again, I look out at the creation of this earth, and I'm I'm blessed that I can go and travel as much as I can. And I love the ocean. I love the connection between land and, and sea. So make sure that you you relish in your passions, enjoy the passions that you do have, but never respond to these narcissists. Um, find a support system. I, as I mentioned, I have some wonderful friends around the world, not only being part of um, Targeted Justice Now, thank you again, but also uh, Ikatoa uh, with, with other board members. We had a rally and a demonstration and a conference up in, in Brussels on June the 10th. And you meet other people and you see the pain they're going through, the burns. And these are really wonderful people, um, all levels of life, backgrounds, different countries. And I, I, the last point I just want to say about these narcissists is um, understand that they need the professional help. We don't need the professional help. I've tried to educate people. I've tried to ed educate GPs about this and they've just written me off and I've insisted on having a referral to go and have an MRI or a CAT scan, and they've always come back. Everything is fine, of course. But I met recently on board a, uh, one of the cruises I was on, uh, a wonderful gentleman who's a neurosurgeon. He and his wife come from Brisbane, which is the capital of Queensland. And I was talking about this, and he said, I've heard about this. I, I know about this. Can you give me some more paperwork on this? And it was, it was an amazing discussion because I said, well, Given the fact that I'm getting these voices almost 24-7, what happens when you go in and you you look at these x-rays or CAT scans, MRIs, and you have the, the patient in front of you? He said, well, it's interesting you bring it up because we see also in these um, x-rays, these scans, we also see what are called LFOs, light foreign objects. And I believe that I, I know there are other ways that people can be either implanted or the brain can be scanned and that's that is beamed uh, via satellite 5G 5G into the person's head, but I believe because of the shifting effect that I can feel in my in my brain that I have been implanted or chipped. And he said, Craig, we we look out for uh, the tumor primarily, but the LFOs do show up, but we don't go into that area of the brain, obviously, uh, because they're very cautious uh, because the brain is is so delicate. 
so it was wonderful and 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 i i said so who does this Ian, you know ent specialist ear nose and throat specialist because i know that there's a way that they can go up into the i think it's called the oblongata uh up into those areas of the brain because we only use 30 35 percent of our brain and i feel the pressure when when i'm woken in the morning i feel it very it, it opens up this whole area and i can't go go back to sleep so it's um it's just important that if you are a TI, please have your friends, just if there's one thing you can do, just get them to do the research. Have a look at our podcast. We we have so much information at, at targetedjustice.com and also at ecotor.be about what people are experiencing. Very well. We're moving on from 2007 to 2008. And once again, Wired Magazine reports. Army Yanks Voice to Skull Devices site. It might surprise a lot of people that the acronym V2K actually came from a government website. Thank you, U.S. Army, for giving us that term. When I see psychologists or psychiatrists saying, well, these targeted individuals, they make these fantastical claims about V2K, I want to say, fantastical? V2K, that's the U.S. government term. So you are obviously not educated about it. Nevertheless, Wired Magazine reported that Voice to Skull site existed and then it was scrubbed clean. But the beauty of the internet is that it is forever. And so we have this evidence. They define Voice to Skull device as a non-lethal weapon which includes a neuroelectromagnetic device which uses microwave transmission of sound into the skull of a person by way of pulse-modulated microwave radiation. Once again, pulse-modulated. And the second part of the definition, a silent sound device which can transmit sound into the skull of person or animals. Note, still from the same website, the sound modulation may be voice or audio subliminal message. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, from the U.S. government. Any comments, Craig? Again, Len, it's, it's outrageous that people are still doing this to innocent victims around the world. And as you know, 400,000 cases in the United States is a, uh, is a low estimate, I believe, and 6 million people around the world I know that there are 300,000 people plus in China who are being hurt with V2K. It was written in one of the independent uh, newspapers out of New York, I believe. It's. Um, I, I just wanted to also address the, the discussion I had with this neurosurgeon. I said to him, so these LFOs, and I'll come back to your point, these LFOs, uh, why aren't they picked up? And he said, well, what happens is calcification happens over these over these chips. Um, the bone grows over them, so they're very hard to identify. And there's a, a wonderful site called Citizens Against Harmful Technology, which is citizensaht.org, which explains how the smallest implants can be literally injected into areas of the brain Known, known as nano uh, materials, and you can also go to a site which is www.nanobrainimplant.com. Uh, look, a similar method is used on on patients who have cancer. Now, their areas of of cancer cells are injected, heated, and this kills the cancer. For us, the victims of this V2K torture and microwave pulses, I I'm literally burnt as many people are on their bodies. And I'm targeted every every single day and night from my legs down. The pulse comes through uh, into my head and into my legs. And I know that I have scars on the outside of my uh, skin where literally the surface is boiled because the cell contains liquid. You know, we're 70% made of water, which is which is absolutely stunning. So, Len, I, I yes, and back to your question, these, these devices... Uh, the way that they transmit the sound into or the words into to the skull, there's just so much research out there. All that people need to do is research targeted individuals or, again, go to our sites and you'll have the proof there. 
we're moving forward. The year is 2012, mm. and this is one and only mainstream newscast by a local station affiliated with NBC, located in Palm Desert, California. A lot of TIs have seen this newscast, but I would like to play it in its entirety because I understand that a lot of uh, that a lot of non-TIs will be looking at this. Hundreds of people in the valley say they are hearing voices in their heads. And those voices are being transmitted by microwave or other methods. Well, several viewers asked us to investigate what they call electronic harassment. KMIR 6's Angela Monroe joins us now with what she's discovered. Angela. Electronic harassment, synthetic telepathy, voice to school technology. Chances are you haven't heard of these terms, but after searching the internet, I found dozens of websites dedicated to the phenomenon and several Valley residents who say they're victims. How much more can you invade me than to go into my brain? It sounds like somebody else is reading the book, only it's thoughts. We're not having a group hallucination. This is actually something that's happening. These men all live in the area, didn't know each other before the voices started, and say someone is playing mind games with them. Mostly it's a lot of derogatory uh, comments about whatever you're thinking about. Only time I ever had a whole sentence, he said, this is not about you, which just frosted me. If it's not about me, what, what the hell am I going through all this for? Kevin Bond says he used to have a normal life. I was living in the San Diego area. Uh, I was clerking for a federal judge, and I noticed that I was being followed by a whole bunch of people. According to the websites, what Bond is describing is called gang stalking. He moved to Palm Springs to escape. I started hearing, as you'll hear, the, the hearing voices and what they'll call voice to skull or microwave hearing. Bob Stansfield says his experience was similar and started a decade ago. They were active and following me around here. And I started hearing the, the, the voices uh, a little bit after the, the uh, uh, vehicular stalking. Randall Ringer says the voices started when he was undergoing chemotherapy. The first thing that was said was Randall Ringer. And I sat up straight and I went to the bath, into the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, looked myself in the eyes, and I said, did that really happen? Bond says he's found more than 300 victims locally and is tracking others across the state through billboards. In Johnson Valley, a Freedom House just opened to help people who believe they are being targeted. To many of you who find yourselves uh, the, the object of covert harassment, that there is hope and that you are not alone and that we are striving uh, to, uh, to find legislation uh, for, and we're working towards freedom for all. Derek Robinson leads a national group called Freedom from Covert Harassment and Surveillance. He says he knows who's playing mind games. Rogue government officials that are uh, sponsoring this. Um, also corrupt business officials and um, private citizens. And he also told us how. Most of it is delivered by microwave. And I believe it's satellite delivered, uh, whether someone is uh, on a remote location using a, a laptop or next door using the desktop. Bond says neurotransmitter chips that run off body electricity have been inserted into some people. And they assign cell phone numbers to them. The cell phone numbers are then run through a computer and a computer translates your thoughts. This crime has been available to the, to, uh, the military for 60 years. We sat down with local psychiatrist, Dr. Alan Drucker, to get his professional opinion. There's no scientific evidence and there's no objective evidence to show that what they believe to be happening is factually true. So what does the doctor believe is behind these voices? Information that I found on many of these websites uh, really confirms or is uh, consistent with what I see in delusional disorders. But these men disagree. I've been to a psychiatrist and they gave me anti schizophrenia medication and it did absolutely nothing whatsoever. However, Dr. Drucker says delusional disorder has no real medical treatment and is believed to start because of disrupted dopamine pathways in the brain. These pathways said start to fire or get triggered in the absence of actual stimulation of a person actually speaking or the radio being on, etc. Dr. Drucker says dopamine can be disrupted for a variety of reasons. A genetic pre 
predisposition, illicit drugs, and even chemotherapy. These men have their own theories why they're being harassed. I think that I was targeted because I'm gay. I reported uh, people, someone, um, for selling what I, I thought they were selling drugs, and they, they were. Nationwide, this crime is committed about 60% uh, against white women ages from 30 to 38. But in Palm Springs, it's almost 98% gay men. But it does tend to occur more in populations of individuals who are marginalized or in some way stigmatized in society. But these men disagree and say police in the psychiatric community need to take them seriously. When I worked with the government, I heard a lot of people coming in saying, I'm hearing voices through my tube. Now I look back and I think, are they like I am now and I just didn't pay attention? For them, the voices are a waking nightmare. And Kevin Bond told me they're working on a book project about electronic harassment and pitching the idea to DreamWorks. Back to you. I, I've seen it several times, Len, and I really feel for the gentlemen involved, the victims of this abuse. And I'm very disappointed in what Dr. Drucker said about their situation, that he's basically passed them off as delusional and, you know, go off to a psychiatrist. But we know, we know, again, if you do the research, people go and, as I mentioned earlier on, um, go and go and investigate this yourself. Go to the doctor and the doctor will refer you to a psychiatrist that you're hearing. I've been, I've been told, you know, it's, it's similar to living on another planet and believing that Martians are you know controlling you or the earth is flat or there's no possibility that this this beautiful planet this blue planet was created by a, a being out outside and all you have to respond is well let's look at infinity infinity goes on and on and on and you're telling me that we have so many people articulate people clever people who are being used in this program by these perpetrators who are soulless empty people empty people this is this is just i i've discussed this with with several people I, I i look at the history of the united states and experimentation that's happened in the united states it's outrageous you've just got to google non-consensual experimentation in the united states and and look at what the wars were about where people young people went and fought for our freedom and died for our freedom and now we don't acknowledge them because it's easy just to take the next level of experimentation the next level of technology and use that simply because over the last hundred years look at the development of what's happened in the last hundred years with planes and and cars and and technology as i said earlier on going from one stage to the next it's it's disgusting it's disgusting that these the gay community has been targeted in this way it does so many people say oh it's because people have been using drugs in the past and that's gone and changed the brain the, the brain pattern that's not true that is simply not true i know a lot of gay people and and that is simply not the case they're very well respected they work very hard they give back to the community and it's just outrageous that this uh this psychiatrist has said that i i that was that was done i think in 2012 yeah, 2012, and I would lo like to see what this psychiatrist believes now in 2023. The message really yeah. hasn't changed, and, and it's very unfortunate that we haven't had any other mainstream reporting for the last 11 years. The next slide is about Havana Syndrome. This is one of the very few, re well, this is actually the only reporting on Havana Syndrome that mentions V2K. This is 2017. This is the very beginning, one of the first reports, and listen to what the reporter has said. It, it is mysterious, but you know, the, there are a couple of things from that reporting that there is some place of blame, or at least um, looking seriously at Russia. And then the other is it's not just. Uh, a very disturbing high-pitched noise, but there might even be voices or a message, a continual message that people have been victimized by, you know, this sound um, that, um, you know, there's this kind of messaging coming from it. What more do we know about that? Or, or who is adding there, any credence there, to that? There are a number of... Uh it's really fascinating stuff. Uh, yeah. There are a number of countries, including the former Soviet Union and now Russia, that have uh, microwave weapon programs 
going back decades. There's some evidence that they've been used uh, in other countries uh, against uh, U.S. diplomats, that this was a very active program the USSR had. I, I get That's the end of the, the, the clip. The, the point mm -hmm. that I want to make is that microwave weapons can produce sensation of sound and sensation of voices. It's a subset of the sound. The voices can be modulated. And so this is a subset of hearing sound via microwave technology. Uh, would you agree, Craig? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Lynn. Absolutely. I uh, I have to maintain calm many, many times during the day that people continue to do this to so many people. And, and the reason we... We are doing this is to try and protect future generations why should we have to create a case in north america out of out of texas and why out of belgium also it's 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 so wrong it's so wrong and it just emphasizes the fact that some people just don't have a soul don't believe in the good that god has created in people most people are good what we're doing to each other not only dictators, but what we are doing day to day now, not being able to communicate is is just really sad because most of the messages I receive um, are from texts and people don't pick up the phone anymore and talk to each other. I've tried to, as you, as you know, I used to live in Los Angeles between 1983 and 2011. And I, I lived with, I had a contract with James Cameron, the film director, of avatar and terminator and he did i live i live with them in the compound in, in malibu and that i believe is my first introduction to this dreadful technology we flew up to seattle washington and went to a brain laboratory called iLabs just to, when we were promoting uh, avatar and we saw the transmission of thoughts from a child onto a screen and I was in the second row and Jim was in the front with his wife, Susie, his present wife. And the scientists came out and, and showed the transmission from this child onto a screen. And I didn't react at the time as much as until I, I got back to Malibu and Susie was talking about it. She said, so what did you think about this? And Jim and May that stood up during it and said, this is, this is, I know, I know all about this information. I know about transmission of thoughts. I, I know about this. What what else is there that you can tell me? And it was from that point that I recognised our relationship was was not very good. He didn't honour the contract that I had, which is an aside. That's fine. That's more about Jim and his arrogance. But I, when I got back to to Malibu, Susie says, "So what did what did you feel about this?" And I thought at the time, I thought, "Well, how wrong it was to use a child as an experiment." First of all. And also that this is what he's heavily involved in. And I've tried many, many times to contact Jim and left messages, but he won't return my call. So we have people who obviously uh, are funding this, and I don't believe it's entirely by the government. We have organizations which are um, using their own devices, if you will, to continue this. And his connection with the military was overwhelming. He had a brother who was in the Marines. And I, I sincerely believe that because a man can't stand up and say, no, I'm not involved in this at all, uh, why won't you step out? Why won't you step outside your perimeter? This is a man who said that um, when he was doing some commercials for the New Zealand government tourist office, he he spoke out and said, I, I actually prefer, ever since I was a child, I prefer nature equals to avatar. Uh and I don't really respect, along the lines of, I don't respect meager man versus versus nature. And I thought, well, how dreadful that you make a statement like that. And we have 21,000 children dying every day unnecessarily around the world through lack of, of nutrition, water, um, the, sewage waste, the sewage waste that you see in some of these African countries. So I'm talking about 21,000 children around the world every single day. So I, um, I, I, I have to just, again, tell people, please do the research on this. And, and I just want to finally say to the perpetrators of this, time, of this crime, get ready to subscribe. Yes, to subscribe to the wrath of our creator, the wrath known as karma. It will come down on you. Thank you, Craig.
I would like to close with a couple of quotes from um, this book that I recently read by a physicist, uh, Luis uh, Del Monte, who has um, written several books on uh, various uh, forms of uh, directed energy technology. His 2021 book is called War at the Speed of Light. And these are the quotes. Typically, hearing odd sounds of voices is a sign of mental illness. However, knowing fray effect microwave weapons exist, a person suffering these sensory effects may not be mentally ill, but the victim of a microwave attack. And the second quote reads, although it's a grim reality, we need to acknowledge these types of microwave weapons exist. And fray effect weapons are extremely concerning given that they have the potential to cause brain damage and mind control visible. So my question is, are we ready to accept this reality? Yeah, it is It is the reality at the moment, Len. I don't know where this is going to go in the next few years unless someone steps up. We've got to stop anyone, any organisation, using these weapons now and in the future. Again, it's, it's a precious privilege to be here on Earth. We are so blessed in this limited time that we are here on Earth. We are so fortunate. And one day, future generations will suffer deliberately and disastrously if we are not told by a whistleblower who is still who who is still using these weapons on us. There's no need. We know the technology is available. You don't need to keep terrorizing and abusing and torturing innocent people. And again, this is about the future future generations. I know uh, Dr. Uh, Barry Trower has gone and said that unless we stop this in two generations' time, one in eight children, in only two generations' time, one in eight children will be born healthy. The rest will be born with some form of cancer or some other handicap. And that is disgusting. That is so wrong. So I I reach out to all my TI friends and I, I reach out to those of you who are trying to understand this technology please do the research. We, we have it provided for you on so many websites. Please do the research. And I just want to thank you, Len and Anna, for today. It's absolutely wonderful to be here with you. I have sort of my own summary of this um, presentation on uh, V2K. What I would like to say is that I have confronted many doctors, including psychologists and psychiatrists, about this phenomenon. And it's one thing to admit you are uninformed about the technological aspects of how it could be carried out. And it's another thing to flaunt your ignorance about the subject and sort of bully the victims complaining about their experience receiving V2K. And that, that sometimes that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. If you are a health professional, the question you should be asking is, how can I distinguish between inner voices and V2K? And if you're not asking this question, you're falling behind the curve. And we targeted individuals should be questioning your professionalism instead of blindly accepting your diagnosis. People who know about the reality of V2K will back you up. I personally will back you up. Do not reject their diagnosis. Instead, ask, how did they differentiate between the two? And if they cannot answer, with all due respect, they didn't do their job. Microwave hearing effect is too well established to say, oh, you just imagine it, imagine it. But that doesn't answer the question. And you should feel comfortable pointing it out. And that's what I have to say on this subject. Well, our episode is coming to an end. And I would like to uh, go around the table and hear your final thoughts. Anna, please. And it, yes, thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Craig. And, and I just want to reiterate how both of you are such examples of um, choosing to, to see the beautiful things uh, that life 
has given us, despite uh, the atrocious torture that I know both of you undergo. And that's what I, I invite um, the, the TIs out there. I know it's difficult to do, but to try to do because uh, it really makes a difference in our days when we wake up and being grateful and uh, and choosing and choosing happiness. We will very, very soon. I am confident we will be free and uh, justice will prevail. So just imagining it, envision it. Um, I I tease now uh, every day. My this is my ambition every day. We're going to have a big targeted justice building to help many people, and it's going to be big and beautiful. And so that's my that's what I envision every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just envision your future, envision what you want when we're free and repeat it to yourselves every day. Make it make it a reality in your mind and it'll come true. Glenn. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and now, Craig, for your final thoughts. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Lynn, for this opportunity. I hate to say it, we are in a world of evil at the present time. <clears throat> I can't do anything that I really want to. My my course, my journey has been stopped because of the, idi the idiocy associated with this technology. So I'd just like to reiterate, if you are somebody involved in this technology and you're abusing and torturing other people, you're only here for a limited amount of time. Do the best by everybody else. Step up and stop this technology. And I have in front of me on my desk, I look at it every single day, uh, a statement by Marcus Aurelius, who I just think is one of the one of the best, which is one of the best statements you can ever come across. And it says, when you arise in the morning, think what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. Let's let's take that as a mission, as a focus in our lives to stop this technology. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Craig, and thank you for this wonderful quote. It's beautifully said. As for me, I'm calling this episode Soundless Voices. And this is a message I have for those who doubt that this technology exists or doubt that it would be used against seemingly ordinary people. Look, today we demonstrated to you beyond a reasonable doubt that not everything you hear is a result of acoustic sound waves and not every voice you hear comes from someone else's mouth. Some of it may come from insidious use of this technology. Perhaps you're surprised you never heard of it, but don't allow lack of knowledge to be deciding factor in making a judgment about another human being Imagine this technology is being used on you and you now have the task of convincing others in the reality and feasibility of this technology. You would want others to be patient and listen to your arguments, wouldn't you? That's all we're asking for, for our arguments to be heard and understood. Until then, we'll keep trying. And until then, we'll be here every Sunday. Rain or shine.